back to the 6.5 Summit. In this cybersecurity spotlight, we're joined by Mark Van Zadelhoff, CEO of Mimecast, to explore how AI is reshaping the threat landscape and what it means for the human side of security. From precision phishing to generative AI risks, we'll dig into how organizations can reduce complexity, manage human risk, and build more resilient defenses. Mark, welcome to the 6.5 Summit. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Um, so you're, you know, you're pretty new in the role. You just took over about a year and a half ago. Um, you know, quickly before we 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 dive in, sort of what are your kind of early often observations? Uh, I know you're, you're a veteran of the industry, but just since joining Momcast. And Momcast is a fantastic company. I took over for the founder who was here 21 years. We have 40,000 customers around the world approaching a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, but like with anything, you take over from someone who's been 21 years. Uh, Peter, the founder, is a good friend of mine, but definitely some things that you uh, you get a chance to remodel, fix up, redo the kitchen, move a wall, redo a bathroom, like like moving into your parents' house. So it's uh, it's uh, it's been an honor to move into into that house and, and do a bit of remodeling, but uh, on a very very uh, great foundation and uh, and pivoting the company in a very exciting direction. I think. Well, as a founder, I know those those goals that you're targeting uh, are, are really significant. And I know sometimes trying to take over for a founder is maybe a somewhat impossible job in some ways. But of course, it seems you're going to bring a lot of great expertise and get to that billion. That's such a big milestone. So congratulations on that. We'll be watching that. So let's talk a little bit about you know AI and its, its impact and transformation. Um, in the cybersecurity space specifically, how are you seeing AI reshape it? And what do you think that means for organizations today? What I love about cybersecurity is you have competitors and customers in any SaaS space. And in cybersecurity, you have this third variable, which is the hacker. So I would just point out, first and foremost, before we all, uh, all, all the cool cyber folks and MBAs and podcasters and the like of the world uh, started using AI, the hackers were using it. The hackers always use the technology first. In fact, criminals going way back always pioneer technology. So you remember, I mean, one of the businesses we're in, we're in human risk, we're in insider risk, we're in email security. You remember the old email you got from the Nigerian prince with grammar errors and you know using British English if it was even spelled correctly as opposed to American English. Now, you know, those hackers can make perfectly crafted emails using AI that target you specifically. And of course, with a little more research, they know what country club or golf club you're a member of or where you like to hang out and they tailor it perfectly. So the first thing to remember is hackers got to it before we all did with our clever uh, approaches to using AI. And then on the defense side, in cybersecurity, for sure, we're you know, seeing lots of opportunities. I would say to keep it simple, there's two areas that I'm seeing us use it. One is, is is in improving detection. So we can detect, for example, things that are written by AI engines. We can detect uh, people using shadow AI or using the wrong things. Um, and then the second is for productivity. Like all these cyber products are pretty complex. Any software products complex. We, you know, uh, give people kind of assistance on better using the product, being more productive using the product, spending less time on alerts and false positives, false negatives, all that stuff in the product using AI. You know, you said something profound, but um, there was a time in the past where someone of decent intelligence could sort of look at that email and be like, eh, that just doesn't look right. Um, and I know that there was always a continuum of who could be duped and who couldn't. And obviously some of that was about technical knowledge. Some of that was about um, you know, experience and awareness. Uh, we've seen it hit next level. I mean, look, even even me, uh, someone who has a lot of technical depth, Mark, you know, at times I forward emails sometimes or I'll screenshot a picture of one and be like, this looks like a real DocuSign. And it looks like it's from someone that we do business with. I'm like, but there's just something that smells off about this to me. And I can't tell you how many times our, our cyber team has come back and been like, good thing you didn't click that. Don't click that. Um, They've gotten a lot better, but in the end, you know, most of breaches are still human error. It's like 95%. Um, what are you sort of teaching? Because, you know, giving the technology, I think this has a lot to do with kind of zero trust architectures, is that if we trust nothing, it reduces the chance for humans to make mistakes. And then you kind of have to validate everything. But we also know there's a push pull on how efficacious that is and how efficient that is. Um, but, you know, so overall, kind of what do you, 
recommend with now you have AI, everything's going to get harder. Like you said, the English is better or whatever language is better. Things look more legitimate. Um, and once you click that wrong thing, it's hard to turn back. I mean, it, there's not a lot of room for error. Yeah. 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 I agreed. Agreed, Daniel. Um, hackers don't break in, they log in. That's kind of the mantra of, of our strategy here around human, human risk. And so there's been so much cyber technology layered into the infrastructure, into the technical uh, aspects of every company's infrastructure. But at the end of that, the end of great network security, endpoint security, application security, identity security, app application security, you have a human, an employee still sitting there millimeters away from the keyboard and mouse, and they're going to do something. They're going to click on the email. They're going to open the attachment. They're going to do something untoward. Sometimes malicious, by the way. I mean, I keep thinking about, you know, our current government employees without trying to get political at all. But how many disgruntled employees are there in the U.S. government right now who may not be exactly excited about their employer and what's happening? What what may they do in that situation? So I think you have to think about disgruntled employee, uh, the careless employee, or the one that just gets owned by the hacker because the hacker is so good. And what we're doing is um, you know, also leveraging AI in that is, I think the days of sitting down and watching an hour long awareness training video are over, but what we can do is real time, insert a nudge, insert a block, insert a reminder to someone saying, Hey, you know, you shouldn't really be moving that source code into your personal GitHub. I mean, I know you might think that you own that because you created something so cool the, yesterday, you know, but it's company property or you shouldn't be clicking on that email or you shouldn't be using that kind of language in Slack, Teams and Zoom, right? There's uh, there's just ways of kind of tuning the behavior with reminders, sometimes with a block, sometimes with a smack on the wrist to tell those employees you're taking a risk that is not matching what the company would like you to do. And here's just some reminders or blockers or corrections uh, that make that much more difficult. And I think once you do that a few times, we always say that 80% of the risk is from 8% of your employees. It's just, you don't know which 8% they are. Once you can measure the employee risk, start to train and nudge them and then block it when it still happens, you're gonna improve your posture a lot. I imagine AI, by the way, can figure a lot of that out if it's sort of tracking the behavior. I still remember the old um, Marissa Meyer coming into Yahoo and VPNing and tracking everyone's activities. And I know everybody was super unhappy about it, but you know, when people are working remote and you know, nowadays the way it sends it, there's so much BYOD, we're moving stuff between our devices, we're running work applications on personally. I mean, even to your point, like having that kind of nudge that, hey, like you probably aren't even aware but like you really shouldn't have this app on this device because it's not being, you know, th there's a lot of easy opportunities. And I think the way you have that 95% and then you have that 80, 88 rule that you kind of talked about is kind of a snowball effect of the way technology is diffused these days. Because very rarely are employees on like just one work device. It's, it, you know, we all have an iPad or a, a, our own laptop and a Mac and a company, a phone, and um, it just creates so much opportunity. Yeah, I think employees, I would say you know, we're throwing around our percentages, but a large percentage of human error is not malicious, right? Most employees, even honestly, when they copy that source code over or a couple of addresses because they want to keep in touch with that customer, even after they leave the company, they're not thinking of that in a malicious way. Um, you know, but 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 it is against company policy. It is you know in, you know violating your intellectual property, the safety of your intellectual property. So usually a, a reminder is enough. Again, some people are really out to get their employer. Uh, and for them, you need to take, uh, you know, to be a little harder. But uh, yeah, people, I think to your earliest point, the definition of privacy is, is slipping and changing in our society. And I think people are much more comfortable and understand that they're, they're going to be watched a bit uh, by their employer, by you know, by even more than that, but I mean, people are getting watched all the time on, on, on uh, Instagram and all these apps that they're using. So they're kind of used to people will be taking a look at what they're doing and giving them a reminder when they're doing something weird. Yeah, you got to kind of assume these days that you know, we, we all sign all these terms and policies and don't read them. We've pretty much granted, you know, I was having a good laugh uh, just recently with my wife about, you know, just the ads that we get fed based on... Yeah. I didn't talk to anybody about this, but it was like I was in this place and I tried clothes on and I'm getting, you know, at, it's like it is so precise. And I mean, to yeah. that point, 
I mean, AI is, you know, if I'm reading the room right, Mark, I mean, in your space, AI is just sort of a, it's like a turbocharger. It's an accelerant, right? So everything, not just kind of like the language and stuff, but just volume, right? The volume of which they can attack is also exponential. Yeah, volume and accuracy. And, you know, you, if you want to get into uh, the extreme version of that, obviously, is the deep fakes and those types of attacks that are taking that to a whole new level. So, so let's talk a little bit about like governance. Remember when ChatGPT came out, um, there was a couple of companies that apparently had, yeah, there were some great stories about, they literally had like fed some of their best data into ChatGPT, like company strategy docs and stuff to summarize them. And, and, and this was a great example of like super proprietary company content that got dropped in. And I'm sure small businesses do it all the time. Don't even think much. They're like, this is such a great tool. I'm going to use it to help me write. I'm going to use it to help me summarize. I'm going to use it to help me create. But they didn't have enterprise. They didn't have anything sort of, you know, any partitioned off. It was just literally using the public application. Yeah. I mean, that's just one example. So, you know, you, you have accidental data leaks and, and generative AI. That certainly opens the door for some attacks. You, you know, you have model injection, you know, where people can do things to models to, to mess them up. Um, we saw the early days of bots that were created and then hacked, you know, people created those. I mean, there's so much going on, but like if you're a CISO, how are you thinking about kind of creating governance and ethical use? Because you want your people using AI. Like I think companies that don't have their people using AI are putting themselves at significant risk of falling behind, but you need them to use it intelligently to, you know, so what's the CISO policy strategy that Mimecast is recommending in, in you? Yeah, I think a lot of it is actually quite similar, even though the technology is so much more advanced and sophisticated, the CISO policies we recommend really are the same ones we recommend around data security generically. So anytime you're using a cloud provider and you're going to put data in the cloud, you're going to ask a whole bunch of questions and also the policies around shadow IT, right? So um, for years, uh, we've been we've been obsessed with shadow IT often because we're worried that people are just going to be spending money with corporate credit cards that, you know, boy, this is, I need Canva to do my job. So I'm going to swipe a corporate credit card before you know it, a thousand people have Canva or Splunk back in the old things. They would, you know, put Splunk in place. So I think those two mindsets of, of data security and shadow IT governance are kind of what you need to combine for AI. We have a product that detects usage of AI during, to your point, not just chat GPT, but the week that we had DeepSeek, we saw in a number of our customers that their employees, I mean, DeepSeek, right? They were taking confidential client documents up to DeepSeek just to see how good it was. And it was experimenting with it. So that's shadow IT and that's a data security violation. So what we recommend on the data security side is you need to ask uh, the usual questions of your uh, provider your AI provider, what are you doing with the data? Are you training the model? Is uh, is the stuff that I upload uh, gonna be kept in my domain or shared broadly? So it's all those data questions. And on the shadow IT side, you need a product like the one that we have that can detect the use of shadow IT, can block it if you say, we're using chat GPT, but we're not using DeepSeek. You gotta be able to enforce that with a nudge or with a block. So I think those are the two policies that um, you don't really have to reinvent the wheel on this. You just have to apply them to this AI problem and force it because it is more viral than any other shadow IT problem I've seen. Yeah, it it's, sounds like it's really substantial. And, you know, there's been a lot of kind of companies getting value from tools that they invest in. And a lot of work has been done to help adoption mark of tools that companies invest and buy for their enterprise use. There's a little bit of that turning that on their head. You know, that whole idea is like, how do we make sure people are using things correctly? And, and, you know, the idea of basically kind of prompting people along, that's like, yeah, you shouldn't don't download that, or, hey, don't don't you know run that application on this piece of hardware. Um, this stuff's important because, like I said, I think don't know is probably one of the biggest challenges here. Yeah. Uh, your point about the small number of malicious, those people are going to be very creative and they're going to try to work all around and up and down your software. Um, but the ones that are doing things by mistake that can create huge vulnerabilities, hopefully those are the ones that you can move along. Um, let, let's kind of wrap this up, Mark, with a broad question. You know, if, if you're a, you know, a board of directors or a CEO, maybe you're not even in the tech industry. Maybe you're in manufacturing. Well, every company is a tech company now, but you know, the, the tech isn't your every day. You're not waking up every day thinking about tech and AI. Yeah. You know, what are you what is the kind of best piece of advice 
that you're giving to organizations to navigate all this complexity? Because it feels like it happens so fast that it just feels almost impossible to ever be out in front of this. Yeah, I guess my mantra lately has been on all these fronts is focus focus on the people, focus on your people, focus on the humans, even when it comes in our company to adopting AI across the function so that we become more sophisticated, forget in our product. Um, a lot of people think that's a technical problem. It's a human problem. If, if uh, you want a whole department to start coding with AI or doing customer support with AI or doing marketing with AI, a lot of that is a human issue, not a tech issue. How do you train them? How do you make them understand the risks? How do you get them productive there and not feel threatened by it, right? Let's face it. Most employees out there right now are super scared their job is about to be lost to AI. You have this conundrum that we're doing to, to our employees and expecting them to follow along. So I sat down with my amazing head of human resources here and I said to her, I said, don't forget this AI thing. You probably think it's a CIO problem. It's an HR problem. And I think the risk is the same way. Focus on humans when it comes to the risk. What is the human risk? Again, people are not breaking in, they're logging in through the humans that make mistakes or are malicious and they're taking the data by logging in uh, and, and moving laterally. So how do you train your people or secure around your people so that they don't become the point of entry for hackers leveraging AI. Mark, it was great chatting with you. There's been so many conversations about it. I'm glad you brought up the human challenge because frankly, this is gonna be one of the most profound times. I, I stay optimistic, I hope you do too, that with AI, we will see growth of productivity. Every industrial revolution in the past has created more jobs. I've never seen such a kind of confluence of impact where you have both blue collar, white collar, knowledge, entry level, advanced roles, all kind of being somewhat targeted at one time by technology. But I hope it raises the sort of human, you know, uh, you know, the human capacity, the human uh, condition into identifying and finding the next big opportunity of growth. Um, it's, it's an encouraging time, but it is definitely going to be interesting. It's, uh, I'm optimistic, but as a cyber guy, I'm also paranoid. And it was great to discuss all this with you, Daniel. It was really great to talk to you, Mark. I really appreciate you joining us. Let's have you back on the 6.5 very, very soon. Thanks for joining me here at Summit. All right, everyone, a big thank you there to Mark and the Mimecast team for joining us. As AI continues to drive both innovation and risk, it's clear that empowering people and understanding their role in cybersecurity has never been more critical. Stay with us for more insights here at the 6.5 Summit.